Awesome. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Piotr, and thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, as Piotr said, he picked three really smart people to speak about global sales today. One wasn't available, so he invited me to take his place. Um, um, so yes, uh, it's actually, I was talking to a couple of people. Um, for those who haven't heard me speak or present before, please be aware, I will probably talk very fast. Um, I've got a lot of slides. Don't worry if you don't catch them all at the same time. Uh, my goal is always to just give as much information as possible during the time that I'm on stage. Uh, and then please grab me afterwards to talk about anything specific. Because, again, what, um, when, when Tomek and Piotr invited me and said that I can speak here, they said it's startup sales. You can pick whatever you want to talk, talk about. Um, and one thing that I've been very careful of is I didn't want to actually tell too many people what they should do. Because what you'll see through my presentation is I believe that um, to be successful in sales, in startups, in various different businesses, it's very much a combination of all these great tactics that you hear from very smart people on the market, people like Piotr and so on. Then it's a really nice mixture with you and your people and your culture. And that's why we don't have so many founders out there that, that did this 20 times, because it's not such a copy and paste formula. So what I thought I would do instead is try to talk to you a little bit about maybe the mistakes that I've made over this time, growing businesses, working in different, different, various different brands. And please, the number 500 doesn't matter today. Some companies are, are striving to make 10 customers this year. Some are making 500, some are making 5,000. So this today is really about sharing with you the mistakes that, you, that I've made and hopefully showing you how you can avoid them, let's say. So the first thing I did is I made a mistake with the title of my slide because what I also, oh, there we go. No, nope. oh, there we go. No, this is, uh, Tomek, this might be the wrong presentation. <laughs> so, yes, let's see. No, we're okay, we're okay, we're good, we're good. It's okay, just checking you. Yes, it's okay, it's okay. Okay, so the first thing I wanted to do is say, when I was making this presentation, it was about the first, first customers, thinking about startups in those early days when you don't have huge budgets for ad campaigns, but what I also came to the realization is that it can also hopefully be valuable for people who are looking for the next 100 customers, next 500 customers. And as I said, it's gonna be eight, and the style of the presentation is going to be that I'm going to talk about these eight mistakes. And all I want to do today is ask you questions. With every mistake, there's a question that I want you to think about tomorrow, the next day when you get back with your teams. And I want you to just question the things that you are doing. Yeah, Because a lot of sales is not rocket science. I wish it was. It would make me feel much more in demand. But actually, a lot of it is fundamentals that we just forget over time. So for those who haven't had a chance to, to meet me or I haven't had a chance to know you before, my name is Mick Griffin, uh, currently head of growth at Trafford. I've spent the last 14, 15 years working in Poland with tech startups at GetResponse, Brand24, now, now Trafford. And also what I'm really humble and grateful about is I've also had a chance to work in consulting roles for over 20 different startups in Poland as well. So I'm going to try to share with you some of that information. I'm going to start with the problem, and this is something that you're going to see also through my sales technique. I'm going to start with the problem. Why am I here? Why do I actually feel that we even have this hour talking about this, uh, this, this topic of startup sales? It's because what's the top reason that startups fail? 38% of startups run out of money, yeah? And in, in Poland, this is even maybe even a stronger pandemic because we have a phenomenal talent in terms of developing and creating businesses and creating technologies, yeah? But 38% of startups run out of money. Now, yes, of course, some of that can be related to, oh, we didn't get to raise the next round, the Series A, Series B, but fundamentally, this is down to lack of revenue and lack of sales, yeah? Let's not ignore this. It's okay. Sometimes we build great products and nobody ever hears about them. So what I want to do is share sometimes how we can solve that. Now, the other reason why I'm talking today about mistakes is because the magic formula is, in my opinion, there is no magic formula. I wish I could print out a sales strategy for everyone and just leave it on the chairs and I could go and drink some free beer. 
But fundamentally, I think that there is no magic formula. Like I said, it's a mixture. It's a mixture of all these great advices, and, and it's a, a mixture of all the great uh, mentors we can find on the market mixed with your people, your brand, your culture. So eight common mistakes in sales processes. Let's get started. The first one is probably the one that you're all going to look at me and go, you crazy, Mick. Yeah? Not having a goal. Sales mistake number one. Yeah? And what I mean by not having a goal, this is the first question that I want you to take away. And again, don't worry about writing it down or, or, or so on. Like You can have this later, which is, what would be a successful 2023 for you in terms of sales, in terms of revenue? Now, when I'm doing consulting, when I'm meeting with businesses and I'm asking them this question, you will be surprised how many people don't actually know the answer. Because so many of us look at our businesses and go, I'm really sure we could be making more sales. I'm really sure we are leaving money on the table. But when I ask, okay, great, so what do you need to do? Are we going from probably selling 200 new clients in, in the next year and we really want it to be 400 or what do we know? And founders, God bless you for the ones that are in the room today, you're going to hate me after this, which is they normally, when I ask them this question, we fall on two sides of the panel. One is, what would be a successful 2023? And found them that the extremely confident founder is like, world domination. Like, number one in the market, I want to take on Salesforce. I, I, you know, we are going to be the best. I, I want to be this, I want to be that. I'm like, fantastic. What's the number? And they don't have it, yeah? But they know that deep down they want to be more. They want to be greater. They want to be more visible. And that's great. I'm not saying that confidence is bad. Now, the other end of the spectrum is this guy, which is, I have founders that say, you know what, Mick? If I can just positively affect five people's lives next year, I'm going to feel great. Now, okay, but it's not going to work. Like, we need a number. We need a number. And what I mean by this is, like, again, we all, and this is not only about kind of P&Ls and the benefits of, of, of being profitable and so on. Fundamentally, we need a number. So this is, this is traffic's number for 2023. And if I would have known my competitor would have been in the room today, I might have hidden this number, but it's fine. Yeah, I can't give it up. It's okay. I'm joking. So what I mean is that this is a very specific number. It's 756 new clients in 2023. That's a goal for us. Yeah. And why do I need it to be specific? Now, one thing is obviously to, to make sure that we've got the plans in place to grow, to have the right amount of revenue sales. That's all great. The real reason why I need this number is for this number. How many leads do I need in 2023 to hit my sales goal? Yeah, this is, this is fundamentally important for me because what I actually believe in as a startup, as a, as a technology business, sometimes our biggest problem is that we want to sell to everybody. Everybody can take our business. I, I was talking to a startup recently, and I was like, okay, what do you want to do this year? We want to have 55 new contracts. Fantastic. What's the plan? We just got a list of 55,000 email addresses we're going to send to them tomorrow. Okay, I can't say that it's wrong, but I wouldn't recommend it, because what I want traffic to be is I know that for 2023, all I have to do is be fantastic for 5,000 businesses. I don't have to be great for 75,000 businesses. I can worry about them later, yeah? And this is not me being a rocket science, as I said. We know businesses out there that have already done this, yeah? Airbnb launched just trying to conquer San Francisco. Facebook just started by being in colleges and universities. Now, I think like two years ago, the last study was that the, the, the biggest rising demographic on Facebook was like 45 years old and above, yeah? There's no chance Zuckerberg thought about that when he was building Facebook in the beginning. Because if he would have, he would have never ended up with a product that was great for everybody. So by actually knowing what you need to deliver next year, you can decide how many people you need to be great for and expand later. Yeah? So you'll see that some of my mistakes, some of my points, they roll into one another. They're very common. So as I said, one of the biggest mistakes I see is we're trying to sell to everybody. And this is a mistake that is not easy to fix. Even knowing this at traffic, we still have this problem. And selling to everyone is selling to no one. This is something that I've always preached forever and ever, that we need to be great. To have a great next year, we probably don't need to be great for every business on the planet, especially even if they can use your product. That's the hardest part ever. It's much easier when there's certain people that by default can't use your product. But when you know that everybody possibly could, 
it's even harder to narrow down and start to be able to say no to people. So the second question I've got for you is, do you know tomorrow when you open your laptop and you're going to work or you're going to start connecting with your team members, who is your perfect customer? And when was the last time you actually checked it? Yeah, this changes constantly. So for me, when I joined Traffic two, two and a half years ago, and we thought, okay, we probably would be really good for startups and SaaS products in Poland. Okay, let me go speak to Camille from Server K and ask him why is he using a different product? And one of the things I realized is he was like, I thought Traffic was for uh, freelancers, yeah? And that was a prime example of the fact that Traffic was, and still to some extent we have this problem, we were trying to take customers from all the, all the places, agencies, uh, freelancers, tech companies. We were trying to be great for everybody. And this is something that is totally understandable because when we're a startup, we want to make money. But we don't realize sometimes how much that money and how much that one customer or two customers pulls us off track. So we've got to try to be really good for a really specific group of people that actually will get us to our goal for 2023. The next one which is not having company-wide buy-in. Now this is a little bit strategical, but I always share it because I think it's super important, right? So let's say you've answered question number two, who do we want to be great for? And you've sat down, you've said, oh great, I really want to be good for tech companies in USA, fantastic. Go ask your CTO. Go ask your CMO, go and ask, the, go and ask like your social media manager, who do they think you should be great for? And again, during my time, when we do this exercise inside some really, really great companies, you'll be surprised how much the answer different. So for example, if there's a company that thinks it's building rockets, the amount of time I've seen it when sales and marketing are like, yes, we are building Lego rockets, they are going to be amazing, we are going to target families and children, it's great. And then you open the, the door to product and IT and they're building actual rockets with actual engines. And you realize that there's a massive disconnect between what we are trying to sell and what we are trying to build because we don't, too often we don't sit still, we don't stop and we don't make sure that the company is in alignment. And when I joined Traffic, this is another example, which was, I believe that fundamentally most markets are split up into three categories. What is, what is it that you do? Should I buy it? Or I already know what you do and I need to pick a provider. And when I joined Traffic, our marketing was very much base level. This, what is an ATS? Let me explain it to you. But when you looked at our product positioning on the market, our pricing was actually for a totally different audience because our pricing was already too expensive for the lower group. Yeah? We, were, we didn't have a freemium, really. We didn't have a, affordable pricing. And then when we went into product, we were building advanced customizations, integrations, being specific for companies like Randstad and so on. So one thing that you have to do as a business, no matter if you're five people or 50, make sure the team is aligned. Make sure that if you know what the ideal customer persona is, so does every other department, even down to accounting, because the way that you invoice, the way that you bill your clients matters. Yeah? So you get this synchronization that is all about back into sales and bringing clients on board. And to give you an example, and just, this is, a, this is like a, just a little add-on here, which is, Make sure that you don't go to your team tomorrow and say, who is our ideal customer? And I'll give you an example. What we do at Traffic every three or four months, we have a question which is, which customer do you think that we should be best for? And we gave them an idea of NetGuru, Adeco, Poland, and Zabka. So for anyone, out of the, anyone who isn't familiar with the recruitment space, these are fundamentally different types of businesses and how they, how they process. And you can see that even after we do this really hardcore in traffic, we still have various different answers. And when you've got a, a company with 30, 40 people, if two people are pulling in a different direction or trying to sell a different kind of business or build a different type of product, you can be losing 6 7% efficiency of your entire company just by, just by two people in the same room thinking that they are building slightly different things. Sales mistake number four that I've learned super recently. Now, now as Piot said, I used to, I, I, previously I worked at Brand24, and Brand24 is an inbound sales lead machine. We were, we, even now I have to ask Sadek what we get, but even when I was there, it was 10,000 new leads every month coming in, testing the product. And now I realized that isn't for everybody. And your business has to consider this super, super important. As founders, as heads of marketing growth, even heads of sales, we think that inbound is the holy grail. But this meme kind of like summed it up for me. 
we don't always realize that inbound actually can take us away from what we are trying to do. So question number four that I have for you is, do you qualify your inbound leads? Because one of the things that I was guilty of in the past, still guilty of till very, very recently, even at Traffic, was, okay, we have an outbound strategy. We are going after tech companies in Europe, and it was like, oh, shit, wait, we have 10 inbounds. Let's talk to them. Let's do whatever we can. Yeah? And we suddenly get off track, and we think that we've got a great process. And then my sales team come to me saying, okay, I've got a 75-question document from a power plant in Lithuania. What should we do? And I was like, oh, we don't think we should do that, to be honest, because we don't really have the infrastructure in place to actually be for that kind of client. But when you're in startup mode and you get someone that wants to take your business and you don't have to fight for them, we feel ourselves getting pulled all over. Suddenly we're taking leads from China, from USA, in various different categories, and in, in we're bending over backwards to, to, to kind of close uh, national government accounts when actually we want to be for tech companies and really, really lean. So it's a super important question in your organization if you are ready to be able to say no to some inbound leads that are not your ideal customer persona. And they can be really, really distracting. We've got to be very careful how we do this. And they, for me, was like four, what I did today is I split it into kind of like four mistakes that we make maybe on a positioning on a strategic level. And now what I want to do is cut into kind of like mistake number five to eight, which is more about working directly with leads, okay? Sales mistake number five, and you're all, I, I believe that you all go, yes, I know this. We shouldn't be talking about ourselves. We should be talking about problems. Yet my inbox is filled every day with people not talking about my problems, yeah? We've got to be really, really aware of this. So question number five, which is, my ideal customer persona, what is their problem today? And I, was in, in, I know even in this room, we have some phenomenal businesses that are already international on the market, but also think how much the landscape has changed in the last two weeks, never mind the last two years. So the thing that when we were building our business out of, from the scratch and we were like, okay, our, our potential clients, they really have a problem with things being too complicated. We're going to simplify it. Yes, we're going to do that. That might be completely different today because things change. Teams get smaller, budgets get smaller, things change. So we have to ask ourselves again, what is the biggest problem that they have? Now, some of you have seen me talk about this before, which is, for a very long time, we've had the aha moment. Anyone heard of the aha moment? Yeah, there's some nodding, yeah, it's great, yeah? And I really like the aha moment. It's that thing in sales, which is like, let's get the lead to the aha moment, and they're gonna buy the product. That's normally how it works, which is great. But we now live in a world that makes that slightly harder because when we say to somebody, let me show you the aha moment, they're like, no, don't have time for you today. I'm busy. Yeah. So what we have to look at from a sales perspective and a growth perspective is this is no longer the timeline that we can focus on, which is after someone becomes a lead, we have to think about what was the problem that they had, what was the pain they had, before they even started considering to use a service like yours, yeah? So if we have the aha moment for that positive interaction, when I get to show someone that sweet part of the product, we have the oh fuck moment for the pain, yeah? So in my industry, in recruitment, one of these first ones is, oh, our backend developer just resigned. Oh, fuck, yeah? That's what I'm approaching here. The oh fuck moment is when the pain occurs. When, and it's pain and, and looking for and that, that demand and need for solution that drives forward the decision making, that drives forward the action. Because if someone doesn't have a pain and you haven't identified it for them, they will not invest their time into you in 99.9% .9 of the cases. And I explained this lately that pain doesn't have to be severe. Pain doesn't have to be severe. So the way I can explain it is, I imagine that you have a little cut from a, paper, from a piece of paper on your hand. You're not feeling it. It's okay. You are working day to day. You're getting by without it. In sales, what we have to do is say, can you just touch that for a second? How does it feel? Oh, crap, that really hurts. That's our job, to remind people of the pain, of the problem. So, and not only do we have to find the pain, we have to remember that there can be multiple pains. 
oh, my backend developer just resigned, oh crap, like, well, I have a need, I'm probably gonna need a solution to this. Okay, let's go find some candidates. Oh shit, that's harder than I thought it was gonna be. Okay, let's go, like, you know, let's go talk to one of our developers and see if they've got any friends that they want. Okay, that's not stuff. So the pain is constantly developing and we have to track it and we have to go with it. So talking about problems is key, yeah? So in my market, when we do this, we have to constantly be checking it, and I have one, uh, one lead from Romania whose problem is affordability, that there's no affordability, and no, they, they see ATSs as being enterprise in their market. The second thing is, is we obviously have networks, yeah? Right now is the problem that we don't have enough candidates, so the wrong candidates. This is obviously for my industry in recruitment, and we can see which problems are evolving. And the other thing that you can do, which I'm gonna explain why later is, Every time you talk to a lead, validate the problem as well. Hey, listen, I, the, you, I just looked at your website and I guess that you're having a real problem getting people to the pricing page. Actually, yes, I am, great, we validated the problem. Yeah, so talking to people, making interviews. Now, this is extreme because what, what we did at Traffic, and I recommend, and I think a lot of you already do this in the room, is when you're doing those discoveries, invite people if you can record them and share them as, as information. Bottom line with sales. You only have to solve one pain. That sounds easy, right? The hard part, it has to be the right pain and you have to solve it really well. So what I mean by that is like, when you're doing a sales pitch, you don't have to pitch 10 solutions, 10 features. We have to pitch one really well and see if it connects with the actual lead that we are talking to. Okay, mistake number six, not providing value first, okay? This is something that, anyone here heard of Gary Vee, yeah? Yeah, we've heard of Gary Vee probably, one way to. I go through phases with Gary Vee where I love him and then, and then I hate him because he just says the same thing. But the thing that he does say over and over is this thank you economy. Give, 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 give first, yeah? And this is something that sometimes we forget. So one thing, again, question number six that I'm gonna honestly recommend that you do tomorrow when you connect with your team, Ask yourself the question, when I'm pitching a lead first or when I'm making a first connection with a lead, am I asking for something or am I giving something? Yeah? Sales has a very fundamental problem right now that I think you're all going to connect with, which is the, can we have a 15-minute call? This is an ask. This is not giving value. This is an ask. And what I love about this is about a year ago, the whole community decided, oh, we've been asking for 30 minute calls and people don't like it. We need a solution. Let's ask for 15 minutes instead. It's not the solution, right? Because we are asking upfront. We are asking, hey, listen, you don't know me. You have no idea who I am. I want you to give me 15 minutes of your time. And we don't value time as currency. Time is a currency. If you're asking people for 15 minute calls, for a, for a test, go tomorrow, instead of asking for 50 minutes, ask them for $5, ask them for five euros, because it's the same thing. We have, to folk, we have to think about it as a currency. And value can be more than an ebook link, because this is what we did. When we're like, okay, we have to give something first, we have to build trust, let's give them a blog post. Let's give them a, an ebook link, let's give them a report for free. And yes, it's still giving, which is phenomenal, I really appreciate that, and it, and it works, and it's still better than saying, give me something back. But what we can also realize, value can be giving a shit. So what that means is like, hey, John, I'm reaching out because I saw on your website that you just closed a deal with Uber. That's amazing, great job. I'm sure that's phenomenal for your team, and probably you've increased the workload 10%. It can be more valuable, more personal than, than actually getting like a link or a free download or a free coupon or whatever it may be. Value doesn't have to be something tangible. It can be something very emotional just by showing leads that we care. Yeah. Sales mistake number seven, limited to live channels. This is probably my, my hot bee in my bonnet topic that I'm getting used to so far, which is, do you need live interaction to give leads value? So I've, and some of you have seen this example before. So I had a lead in the past when I was working at Brand24 that was like, made a good connection, looks like you guys are getting a good service. And I was like, okay, it's a nice pitch. I, I like this, it gets me. And then that person was like, hey, listen, actually, Mick, I help chief revenue officers lower churn in staff companies. And I was like, I'm a chief revenue officer in a SaaS company and I have problem with churn. Okay, it's a really good pitch so far. And then he wrote, can we have a, fifth, a quick 15-minute meeting? 
And what I wrote, and I even checked this person out on LinkedIn. I mean, even their job title was like churn reduction experts for helping chief revenue officers. It was like slam dunk. And I was actually bought in. I had a problem with churn at Brand24. It was a huge problem. And I, went, I wrote to this lead and I said, hey, listen, I love what you're saying. Churn is a hot topic. So I'm telling you that I'm a qualified lead, but I don't want to call yet. Pitch me. Tell me anything else. Keep me here because I'm a little bit allergic to calls. Ironically, I've been in sales for a long time and I, I hate getting phone calls. And what happened was, two weeks later, he wrote back to me saying, oh, Mick, sorry about the delay. Actually, I looked at Brand24 and I think you're doing everything right. I can't help you. And he was wrong. We were not doing everything right. Oh, my God. But what happened was I took away his single channel of selling to me, which was a call, and he fell apart. He fell apart because he, as, as salespeople, we have to adapt to different ways that people want to, sell, want to be sold to, right? And he fell apart. So I started to run a little experiment because I get a lot of these, can I have 50-minute calls all the time through my LinkedIn like everyone else does. So I started saying, I'm afraid I'm deaf. Can you pitch me any other way? And this person stopped talking to me instantly. And this person said, I said, sorry, I'm deaf. I can't have a call. And then he wrote, OK, on the call, we can discuss your requirements. And I'm like, on the call? I just talked. Like, it's, it's fundamentally insane how much we can't break away. And that's why I said I didn't want to stand on the stage today and tell you what to do. Because as a sales industry, we are suffering be from being told what to do, follow the script, go through these steps. It's, it makes no sense. So ironically, we get too caught up in this. But in the flip side, what I love is I love when people change the dynamic. So here was, was uh, the, the girl from uh, Hook. Uh, it is a SaaS. And she sent me a LinkedIn voice note. And I was like over the moon. I was like, yes, amazing. I don't have to have a call with you. You can pitch me value. Why do I love it? Because I get to choose when I consume the pitch. Yeah? Time is one of our biggest enemies in sales. So therefore, every time you have to sync your calendar and free time with a lead, you have lost, you have, you, you have wasted, you are losing leads instantly because if you have to communicate live all the time, you are going to lose leads. So give them things that they can consume in their own time. And this was even a scenario where I said, I can't buy your product, but I love it. I, I'm, I'm, I come back to me, like I want to talk to you. And if anyone's wondering, like, yeah, Meg, that sounds great. How do I do it? Even if you want to put this into your sales structure, there are tools that actually you can send a, like non-synchronized uh, communication and pitches, and the tools will tell you when your video was watched, how far did it go. Mostly all those things that you take from a traditional call, like, you don't want to call when somebody stops listening because you didn't hit the right pitch. This will tell you, like, oh, the person sped you up to 2.5 speed after five seconds of speaking. Probably what you would do if you could on this presentation right now. But you can't, so sorry. But anyway. So, Bonjoro, Vidya, these are all tools that you can actually pitch people and they can consume it in their own time. And you still got all the analytics and behavioral things that you're kind of looking for when you have live talks. Last but no means least, sales mistake number eight. Not playing the long game, yeah? So I think, again, this, I couldn't really come up with the right title for this mistake, but I basically wanted to ask you if your pitches are based on actions of your leads or times or, or like cycles. So what I mean is I've, been, I've made this mistake where I've been like, on day 15, pitch the client, pitch the lead to buy your product. On day 12, tell them this. On day four, they... But actually... This is a mistake in most cases, unless you're working on a huge number of leads. Because in, in theory, we want to actually do things based on how our leads react and what they are doing. Yeah? So what we have too much of is we are trying to sell on the first connection. And remember, that might work today if you are a Canva or someone like that, where you've got brand behind you. But if you're a startup or you're growing into a new market, your brand won't be able to back you up. So when somebody gets a pitch and they're like, first of all, don't know who you are. There's a small chance you hit the nail on the head with what you want to sell me. But you're already saying, like, go check out the pricing and you've, you've gone too fast. Now, one thing I went through with my team, and I don't know if this is valuable or not for you today, is to remember that. There are so many things to take away from a lead interaction other than the sale. Please, please remember this, that 
if somebody says like, hey, I'm not going to buy today because I have a 12-month contract. Great, awesome. Can you tell me, like, would you buy at the end of the contract? Yes, I would. Actually, that's great. Even all the way down to the fact of, you know, could you tell me, like, I talked to you today about this problem, which was that, you know, traffic will save you time. Can you just, like, I just want to, I know you don't want to buy the product today, but can you tell me, is that a problem that you're actually facing right now? Yes, it is. Or no, it's not. But it's value. What we shouldn't do as salespeople and founders is when somebody says, make, I'm just not interested in buying traffic today. You know, not what most of us do, we just shut down. Okay, how can I close this Zoom as soon as possible? You know, like we, we just give up. But what we can find out is so many other things. So we have this kind of like shopping list of data and feedback we can take from sales experiences, even if it's not the client. The other thing as well is like, the thing, we did the, um, uh, we did the interviews when I started Traffic because I wanted to learn more about the industry. And two of these are actually now our client because, of course, it was part of my pitch. They didn't know it at the time, but I was playing the long game. First, I asked them, how are you doing? I think you're super smart. I'd love to show you out to the rest of the traffic audience. They would love to hear from you, which they did. By the way, while I'm doing that, I'm going to learn all about the problems that the market is currently facing. That's awesome. Thank you so much for that. And then two months down the line, I can be like, by the way, are you still having that problem? Maybe I'll show you traffic. Yeah? We're playing the long game. Yeah, we're playing the long thing. These help. And you get to this. This is something I learned 20 years ago, like a long time ago in one of my first sales trainings was you get to decide what is a closed loss. Who relates with that? Who knows what a closed loss is? It will show how many people are using a CRM. Yeah. You get to decide what a closed loss is. It blew my mind when I heard this because I was like, oh, the client said, no, thank you. Okay, closed loss. No, you don't have to. You can put them somewhere else. You can try to find a different value. And if you take anything away from today, it's this. Uh, sorry about the graphic. I stole it from the internet. But it basically says 70% of salespeople give up after the first email. 70%. After no response from the first email, they give up. They stop pitching. They stop writing. They stop even asking anything. Even the crappy, did you get my last emails? They just don't do it. 70%. Yet... On average, it takes five touch points to actually get a client to convert, yeah? So already, if you take away from this that I'm going to do five touch points instead of one, you're already putting yourself at an advantage that 70% of the market is not. So it's really important that we, we stay connected. Now, just to, just to kind of conflict with myself a little bit here, which is we have to react to what our users are doing. One, one of the fundamental things I get in Poland is that we sometimes overreact. What I mean by that is that, has anyone ever got an email like this? When I was at Brand24, sending automatically 10,000 emails from my email every day, I got these emails all the time. Can you stop fucking sending me emails, Mick? Like, go and die. And I'll be like, okay, I'm sorry. But when I talk to startups, when I talk to companies, it's so surprising that when they get that email once, they throw everything out of the window. That, oh my God, nobody wants our emails, turn it all off, throw it down, let's not be, you know, let's not be intrusive, let's not push people too far. No, first question you have to ask yourself, is this person in my ideal customer persona? Because if they're not, you don't have to care. It doesn't matter. Make sure you've got an unsubscribe link and you're fine. Like, don't throw everything away because one person gets offended, yeah? I'm kind of like anti-GDPR, but my team hate me for it. But even, even with GDPR, yes, Maybe you're not allowed to send someone an email. Go find them on LinkedIn. Go find them on Twitter. Go find them on Facebook where they have abilities to send people information in the right way. So don't throw everything away when one person tells you it's too much. Okay, I have no idea how long I was, but probably too long. However, like I said, I will make this presentation available some way through lovely people at Aula. But like I said, I'm not here to reinvent what you do as a sales team or as a sales department or as a founder doing sales. What I am here to do is ask you if you go back and ask yourself, are you doing the things that you probably learned years ago, you forgot about, go and make sure that your team are on the same page as you, and just go revalidate the things that you already know, because sales is, is really hard, and sometimes we, we, we lose the fundamentals. So with that being said, thank you very much. I told you I would speak a lot. Thank you, Mick. Thank you, Mick, <laughs> once again. Wonderful job. Thank you. Uh, any questions to Mick? Oh, oh no, okay. <laughs> <laughs> really, really great presentation. Thank you, Mick. Uh, I was like uh, writing down the questions, so 
we will take about an hour for <laughs> for all the questions. So okay. no problem. But so, uh, just joking. One question. You said that like sales have to have a number. Yeah. And you've also said that focusing on inbound can, might spoil your uh, spoil your uh, effects or uh, addressing uh, ideal, ideal customer persona. Mm -hmm. So we are doing an uh, outbound team because we want to structure our sales team. Mm -hmm. At the 17th slide, you said that the worst thing we can do is focusing uh, in SDR. SDR is like outbound top of the funnel, uh, are focusing on scheduling a meeting because mm -hmm. they are not giving a, a, any value. So what kind of number SDR should have if it's not uh, scheduling a meeting? Great, great question, by the way. And so my, what I would like to say is that I think that you definitely can kind of KPI goal SDRs on meetings scheduled with ICPs, let's say with ideal customer personas. I just think we should take the pressure away from them having to do it in the first reach out or like the second reach out to be able to have time to build that. But on top of that, like you said, we have to have a number. But what I think that one of the mistakes I made, and I don't know if anyone else has done this, which is again, we, we had this outbound like, okay, SDRs, we need 5,000 leads by the end of the year that are our... Uh, uh, SQLs or MQLs, however you des decide to like ex explain them, like marketing qualified leads, sales qualified leads. But we didn't have the same process with inbound. And then suddenly we were like, oh, you know what, we've got a thousand inbound, so we only need 4,000 outbound leads. But when you actually qualify the inbound and you find out there's only 55 good ones, and then suddenly at the end of the year you're wondering why your numbers are off. So what, what it was for me is like, yeah, like I think that SDRs, it's great to have SDRs separate from inbound. That's something that I've learned the hard way. I think it's really hard to do inbound and outbound at the same time. But fundamentally, we have to make sure that inbounds, we qualify them as soon as possible like to make sure that they are part of that big 5,000, 10,000 leads, whatever you need in a year. So I do think that SDR should book meetings. I just don't think it should be in the first reach out, if that makes sense. Else, I have a quick question for a pass over. Um, I love selling. What was the worst sales speech that you made? And then you actually, you thought, oh, fuck, I sold. I, I have a really good story for this. Sorry about that. But I'm, I've had this before. So, um, so when I was like, uh, when I was living back in the UK, I was selling, uh, ironically, I was in a temporary recruitment agency. And it was hell. It was horrible. It wasn't a job that I wanted to do. I, I had a job. And what I basically did was every day I had to try to put workers in factories for the, just for one day. That was like my, my role. And it was crazy that I had to make 100 calls before 9 a.m. every day. Because it was like, after 9 a.m., work had started, factory was going. There was really, it was not really like in demand. So I had one factory guy, and these factory guys were like big, burly guys. And I'm like, oh, hey, John, it's Mick from Primetime Recruitment. Do you need anyone today? He's like, no, Mick, thanks very much. Cool. Next day, hey, John, it's, and I had to do it. It was the rule. I would get fired if I didn't. Hey, John, Mick from Primetime. Mick, listen, buddy, I don't need you. If I need you, I'll call you. Great. No worries. Thanks, mate. Next day, Mick. I'm like, hey, John, it's Mick. He's like, Mick, will you just fuck off? And I'm like, okay, I'm sorry, John. Okay, yeah, yeah, I won't call you again. Next day, hey, John, it's Mick. He's like, Mick, you work at Primetime Recruitment? I was like, oh, it's a deal. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I've got Primetime Recruitment. Yeah. Right, I'm going to come to the office and I'm going to knock you out. I was like, oh, shit. And purely, like, I don't know where it came from. I was like, listen, so while you come and knock me out, let me send someone to cover your work in the factory. And he laughed. And he didn't knock me out, by the way, thank God. But he literally was like, okay, you got me. Like, that was a little bit funny. But that's also something like, a different sales tactic for me is that if you can make people laugh, it, it, it brocks, takes down all the walls. But yeah, the worst thing is, is when you're in a... Today, it doesn't really happen, I don't think so much, but... I think as an as a SDR or a sales rep, when you are in such a refined structure that you don't get to almost make any decision-making processes, it's horrible. It's horrible. I lasted in those jobs like six months at a time because it was like 100 calls before nine, 15-minute break, then do this script, and it was like, no point. But when, you got, when I finally got into roles where I could do it my way or with a little bit of flexibility, uh, and that's why I'm, I'm kind of a little bit anti-script. You can have scripts to help people fall back onto, but not to kind of like make them do it. But yeah. 
yeah, 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 a little bit. Maybe just I was also being like a little bit of a shit, so yeah. Yeah. <laughs> A mogę tym rzucać? <laughs> Hi, Mick. Um, you mentioned that there are many companies that say we can sell to anyone, we can help anyone. How do you, how do you think, how do you, they should start thinking about the ICP? How should they start evaluating who they should focus on? Yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's definitely, a, a, I think it's a great question. If obviously, it's easy to say, like, narrow down but maybe you, maybe you don't know how to. So the first thing for me is still, like, if you can sell to everyone, the first thing I can only remind everyone is that you don't actually have to, which is a scary thing for CEOs and founders to think about. But I think that, that from the first few slides, which is, do you have, how many people do you have to grow by? Okay, it's a thousand new customers this month, uh, this year. How many leads do I potentially need to make that happen? Yeah? So we're, I, I prefer to work with the numbers and then decide who's the group. So, okay, I need 10,000 potential, uh, potential leads this year to make my target. And then we, we did this at Traffic. It's no, no, so like we needed to say, let's say 7,000 businesses who were recruiting. And we were like, okay, so let's think about tech companies in Europe. And there was like 75,000. You can't stop there. Then you go, okay, so I need to get this down to 10,000. I actually have to work hard. Okay, how do I get this down? Okay, let's just do Central Eastern Europe. It got it down to 25. Okay, how can we go further? Let's look for companies that uh, don't yet have an internal recruiter. Okay, that got me down to 10,000 and stop. That's, so I actually kind of, I call it reverse engineering or like, you know, peeling the onion, however you want to call it, like all those fun things. But fundamentally, even if you can sell to everyone, I think it's the hardest thing because you don't have to. But I always think numbers first, what do I need? Then find the others. Because the other thing you can do, just to be aware of, you can go too narrow. You're like, okay, I need 700 clients next year, and you have a target audience of 1,100. You're like, oh, wait, shit, now I have to convert them at like 80%. Like, it's not going to work. So you can go too far. But numbers first, in my opinion, and then, okay, what would be a great group for that number, if that makes sense? Thank you. Last question. Oh, no, it's just me. <laughs> hey, Nick. All right. Hey, man. Well, here it goes. Uh, no, uh, I'm just uh, curious. Have you ever bought anything from, uh, from a person uh, that actually approached you on uh, LinkedIn? Yes. Is, is there a, could, you, could you share the story maybe? Yeah, and, and to be honest with you, like, I probably, the funny thing is, is I can say yes because I always have one thing in my mind. But probably in general, I've brought other tools, but I don't remember anymore that LinkedIn was where it started. And then it went to email, then we met at a conference, and then suddenly we ended up buying like Keep or whatever it may be. But I remember uh, we bought a tool called Ask Nicely. Um, and it was an MPS tool. And this is that, when I said 99.9% .9 of the time things don't work, in my opinion, I literally just stopped having a meeting about we should, we should be tracking NPS, and I got a message saying like we do NPS. I was like, okay, I just can't ignore that. It's just fate. Like, okay, good job. But like within milliseconds of finishing a meeting. Um, but that was just because of the timing. But pure, pure luck. But I think I've bought tools like we bought into D2 Crowd. We bought into Heap. We bought into AppQs through probably relationships that started online. But the other thing to know is that I don't count LinkedIn as like starting a relationship from an in-mail. I counted, like, we connected, they commented on my post, I commented on their post, etc. So, and the other thing as well, I think that some people did a really good job of me thinking I'm pitching them, and then they managed to pitch me and I bought their product. So, yeah, it also works sometimes. But it, it happens, like, I think, but I just don't remember, because the journey is so long and they play it so cool, I think it's multi-touch rather than just LinkedIn. Yeah, makes sense. Thank you. No problem. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mick, once again. Thank you. Um, great applause to him. Thank you.